All right, a little summer bonus dolly today, folks. We've been telling you Rick Dollywell is going to join us, and he finally does here on Sakaris and Price featuring Jeff Patterson. Rick, how's August treating you, sir? Uh, so far, so good, gentlemen. Love the golf, not with you guys. Uh, no. Tater and I were out yesterday out in Surrey uh, golfing. Uh, but you know with Tater, he's not golfing unless it's free golf. And oh, no, yeah, yeah. So when we get free golf, because in the media – there is, much, you know, I'm going to take you back to 1996 when Rogers <laughs> opened up. And remember the meals at the Canucks games were free? Oh, yeah. Oh, and we were loving it. Like, it was just, you come in an hour early, get a free meal. And then a few a few years later, they started to make you pay. And you're like, what? What? <laughs> the cheapest human beings on earth are media guys. We're always looking for free stuff. Free stuff. Yeah, and if they- you get stuff, we're in. I think it was an $8 meal to start, and we still uh, yeah. griped about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, going. You know, I, I, I stopped going. 14 I, at least it was last year. So it's $14. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Uh, uh, before we get going on the regularly scheduled topics, we've been uh, batted, we yeah. batted around a little bit at JT Miller's appearance on uh, a yeah. uh, Cam and Strick podcast. Any, anything jump out at you there from what, what he said? It, it just seemed like a really good personality synopsis for us um but that's that's kind of it what did you take out of it i'll tell you i i like jt miller a lot i think he's an honest player he's got a lot of kessler in him you know he's gonna tell you what you what he's thinking he doesn't have to like you he doesn't want to like you he said uh you know when he was asked about the media today he said i can't stand some of those guys in the vancouver media but i'm gonna say this and i and i and i i will say this about the last 11 years in this city have been tough. It's been tough on the media. It's been tough on the players. There's been a lot of losing. You know, someone said to me the other day, when you couple the losing with the intense media, Canadian market, uh, social media, the intensity of the combination of the losing and social media and, and the media itself is a double whammy. Vancouver is not for everybody. I, I go back to, you guys remember when Pouliot and Good Branson and all those guys were here. And a lot of those guys, I'm going to tell you, they couldn't wait to get out of Vancouver. I mean, it's just it, the intensity of the losing and the negativity. Uh, the, the best marketing tool in the world, guys, is winning. Mm-hmm. And uh, sadly for JT Miller and a lot of the players in this city, there hasn't been a lot of winning lately. And, you know, and with the winning coupled up with the negativity and, you know, Canucks Twitter could be a, a very negative space sometimes. And the players are, look at Bo Horvat. He reacted to a guy on Twitter. Um, you know, it's hard. We as human beings are built for what? To get a pat on the back. Nobody likes to hear your crap and your, you know, this or that. But sadly, this social media gives everyone a voice. You know, I go back to the 1980s, uh, Blake and Jeff, when the Canucks were so awful. And I don't remember the negativity but now everyone's got cell phones. Everyone's got a voice. Everyone gets to make an opinion on something, on us, the team, the players. It's a whole different world we're living in. And I go back to those Canuck years and before, you know, Arthur got Pat Quinn and, and from L.A. and turned it around. There were some awful years, just awful. There was 8,000, 7,000. I remember going to see the Quebec Nordiques and there was 8,000 people in the building. It was, but we never, I don't remember the negativity back then with the losing mm-hmm. that you see it now mm-hmm. because it's, 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 it's a different world we live in. So back to JT Miller, I, I, I love his honesty. We always bitch and whine about hockey players. They don't say anything. Well, this guy says something. And it's always not going to be what you like, but too bad. This guy's honest. He, get, he tells you what's on his uh, – he wears his heart on his sleeve. I don't mind him. I, I don't mind him at all when he talks. S- social media is a big part of it. I'll also give you Griffith's family versus Aquilini family for a thousand, yeah. Alex. And uh, there's another reason why the tone is different in, in in around Vancouver. Yeah, well, eleven years. Hold on. Let me tell you something else. I was uh, I was at a party last night. <coughs> Anyways, still hurting. <laughs> but listen, I ran into a. I still ran. In, I ran into a 26 uh, year season ticket holder last night. Mm-hmm. And, He's frustrated. You know, he's, he's, he asked, you know, Don Tater says this all the time. You know, we're not on this earth forever. And I want to see a Stanley Cup in Vancouver. <laughs> you know, be, and this guy said the same thing that Don says. He says, you know, I've been a season ticket holder. I'm going to go back. They really thought about 
seriously thought about not renewing. But they're going to go back. And he said, you know what? Uh, I want to see a Stanley Cup. Um, uh, 82, that was the team. That's my team, the 82 team. That's my favorite team of all time. But anyways, he was there in 94 and he was there in 211. But I felt the frustration from this 26 a year season ticket holder uh, last night. Um, he was pouring his guts out. I mean, this is a great hockey market. This is a market that deserves better than what they've been served in the last 11 years. This is an intelligent fan base, but it's uh, we just don't know when this thing's going to turn around. And it's, it's, it's turning around like the love boat very slowly. <laughs> and late last night, you poured your guts out last, uh, as well, didn't you? I, well, <laughs> not, not literally, but uh, yeah. The crowd was going down nice last night. But I... Listen, to, to hear a season ticket holder, and you know the prices today, Blake, they're not yeah. cheap. Well, you know, I, I remember going to the Coliseum in 82 with $10, ticket was 7 uh, the bus fare and, and the popcorn. I got everything in the 10 bucks. What, what do you get for at 10 bucks at a hockey game now? Nothing. Not yeah, even yeah. a watch. Yeah. You know, so I felt this guy last night, 26 years, I felt it. You know, in the last, le- he's pissed. He's mad. He wasn't going to renew, but he did renew, and he says, I'm going to give it one more shot. So if they're going to get this thing headed in the right direction, Elias Pettersson's going to be a huge part of it. Ricky, what's going on? It seems awfully quiet out there. We saw Sebastian Ajo get his deal done. Uh, it's only the first week of August. I get that, but are the two sides, or is there any chatter going on behind the scenes? Well, I checked in on Pettersson yesterday because I knew I was coming on with you guys, and I was told it's, it's, it's very quiet. Uh, the only guy on this planet who thought something was going to happen quickly was Matt Sakaris. And uh, I, I don't see any urgency uh, as of right now from either side. And I'll tell you why. Um, and it's not surprising. I, I didn't think they were going to get a deal done in June or July or, no, sorry, in July or August. Um, the Canucks might be saying, hey, put up another 100 points and we'll gladly pay you. Uh, and also, keep this in mind, you want Pedersen's new contract to kick in when the salary cap is increased significantly. You need it to go up a ton, and then he fits in nicely. His agents, Paperson and J.P. Berry, they're going to bet on their player and th- that he's going to get another 100 points. And then they will have a lot of time to evaluate Pedersen as an RFA next summer as well in, under different circumstances in 12 months. Pedersen's stock could be sky high if he has another 100 points, mm-hmm. right? And so, but in the end, I don't see any issues with either side getting the deal done. My biggest fear with Pedersen is that he pulls the Kachuk or Debrinkat or Luke Dubois. A lot of good players have left Canada recently, guys, uh, and no elite player is going to stick around and lose year after year after year. One of the reasons they're elite players is one of the great traits of elite players is they hate to lose. And in your prime years, you don't want to spend your prime years out of the playoffs every year. You want to be going deep in the playoffs. So, um, you know, let's uh, maybe there's a wait and see approach uh, from both sides. And, and, you know, but right now I can report to you guys it's quiet. And I'm not surprised at all, at all. What is isn't quiet? What, what, what are they doing? Well... Oh, can I get one word in? I, sure. I forgot to get this in on Pedersen. Um, I, I'm still worried uh, about an injury to, to Miller or Pedersen, like say four to six weeks, because they don't have a center in the bottom six that can deliver quality minutes in the top six as a center. They don't. When Horvat was here, the Canucks were so strong up the middle that they didn't have to worry about an injury in the top six. That's not a case anymore, guys. You know, And that's why I think they're still out there hunting to try to make a trade or sign a free agent. They have told, the Canucks have told uh, agents to hold on uh, till they can free up some cap space. The names out there we already know, Maxime Comtoy, uh, Pia Suter. Uh, Pia Suter's agent told me, he says, I'm waiting for teams uh, uh, to clear cap space. Uh, we're in a capped out NHL, guys. Where you know, There's a ton of teams that are fighting for every dollar, every dollar, you know? Um, so Tyler Myers and Connor Garland, uh, those are the two guys, the best way to clear up cap space, guys. Those names are always going to be in the rumor mill, let's be honest. Uh, but it, you know what it reminds me of? The Canucks constantly trying to trade Erickson, Beagle, and Russell. When it comes to Garland and Myers, same thing, same thing. And you guys, I don't have to tell you the price on Beagle and Russell. 
And, you know, I don't have to tell you what the cost was. It was immense. Mm -hmm. And with so many capped out teams in the NHL and the cap not moving up, teams are saying, hey, I'll take your bad contract, but you got to put in a sweetener. And sadly for the Canucks, the last five five years, they've traded a ton of first and second round picks. They're not right. supposed to put those in a sweetener. And so they've got to be cap compliant on opening night, and there are still some mechanisms in place. But I think a lot of people, Rick, think, oh, well, they'll just apply LTIR, and that will get them down to a number that will allow them to, to be cap compliant. But uh, last we heard Tanner Pearson, I mean, the updates yeah. were positive from Patrick Alvine, the suggestion that he was going to show up on their doorstep at training camp as a player, and yet you think all that he went through last year and hasn't played a game since November. Uh, have you heard anything here in the last little while about Tanner Pearson? Yeah, so I, I'm glad you brought him up. Uh, when the Canucks announced in early June uh, that Tanner Pearson was going to be ready for camp, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, not everyone was buying it, um, including myself. Darren Drager told you guys the same thing. I was hearing the same as Drager that, you know, hey, hold on a second. Uh, but I checked uh, in on Pearson this week. Uh, he is now feeling good. He is now skating and working out and getting ready for camp. Uh, that's good news. I'll just leave it at this. A month ago, I wasn't super, super hearing, you know, oh, he's, let's go, camp. But I checked in on Pearson this week. I, I certainly feel more optimistic this week that, you know, he's heading in the right direction. So, but... Um, my thing with you guys on Pearson and McKayhab, they, McKayhab, they were both not in the lineup in the last game of the regular season. So you got to make room for these two. So how do they fit in the roster? Here's the other. Th here's the other problem I got, guys. The Canucks have so many wingers, yeah. and they got to make room for Pod Colson and Hoglander too. They've got to become everyday NHL players. It, it, they got to stop being healthy scratches. Stop going to the farm. It's time for Pod Colson and 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 Hoglander to take. The next step, you know. But think about it: if you insert Pearson, McCabe, Hogletter, and Pod Colson opening night, who's going out? How, how are you making room? Yeah, but room cap wise, room just lineup wise as well. Those well, are two two different issues. I I do think that Ta uh, Tucker Pullman is your LTIR candidate. Last I heard on Tucker Pullman, um, you know, it's not looking good. And, but he keeps continuing to fight the fight. He doesn't want to retire. I feel for the guy. Um, you know, he, he is a guy that has seen a million doctors and a, a million opinions and, and all that stuff. But that, that, to me, is your LTIR candidate. That's not going to be enough, though, Rick. They need more than not, that. But, yeah. but he, he's not turning the corner in terms of positivity about his situation. So mm -hmm. I understand. But yeah. at least... That look, that's looking like your LTIR candidate. But I'm just saying to you guys, um, how are you going to get all these guys in the lineup? Mm -hmm. And they got an abundance of wingers. I mean, they got to do something, something. You know. And go. I, I, I want to say, I want to say one thing about Myers. You know, whether you like him or not, um, he chews up a lot of minutes, and he's a righty. So how do you replace those minutes? I, I know everybody is just gung ho to get rid of the guy. I, I get it you know, clear the cap space, but then just ask yourself, I don't know if you're getting anything back from Myers, but I'm just ask yourself, who gets those minutes, you know? And this is where I, I, I'm going to talk to you guys about Ethan Bear. Um, when I checked in on Bear this week, um, he's still looking to be out till around December. He could sign, I was told, an NHL contract in October or November. Um, insurance is covering Bear's contract till he is healthy. Uh, that makes it easier to, for him and his agent to be patient is that the good thing and the best thing they did when he went to the Worlds was get that insurance because he's covered. He's covered. So that helps uh, him and his agent. Um, Canucks, along with other teams, have interest. Uh, teams called Bears agent on July 1st looking for medical information. I think there's going to be um, there's going to be interest in this guy. So um, that right side, if you after Myers bonus, if you move him, can you bring Bear back? At, you know, at a, he's not going to cost much. You guys know that. You know, so maybe he can eat up some of those minutes. But Kyle Bros is gone, so you know uh, it's going to be interesting to see if they do move uh, Myers, or you can move Myers at the trade deadline, guys. You know, you could really do it then. You'll have a better idea if you're in the playoffs or not. So, you know, there's a lot of a uh, lot of options there for yeah, sure. Uh, let me ask you both on this. Does yeah. Tanner Pearson become more tradable, a more tradable winger than Garland or 
I mean, anybody else on the wing, Bob Brock Besser, did, 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 at that well, price point and with the kind of the grit, the stiffness that Pearson plays with, is he your tradable winger? Well, uh, but hold it a second. Uh, I'm going to come back with you on this. He, his season was shut down January 12th. I think teams Completely. are going to want. Yeah. Uh, Blake, teams are going to want to see him play. Mm-hmm. No one's, no one's trading for that guy. No one's trading for him. You know, you you want to acquire a guy that hasn't played since January 12th and has had seven surgeries on his hand. You know, granted, that, it's not a knee injury though, right? Not a back injury. It's not one of those critical uh, spots. But I hear you. Well, yeah. an, an expiring con like I get where you're coming from, Blake. An expiring contract at three and a quarter yeah. is manageable for a guy that has Stanley Cup pedigree and all that kind of stuff. But everyone around the league is going to have to wait and see. Like nobody's trading for him now. Like yeah. he, he, if he comes back successfully and shows that he yeah. can be some semblance of a fifteen to twenty goal scorer, win battles in the corner, and all that kind of stuff, then maybe. Maybe there's a team that would look to add something like that, but right here, right now, uh, he's going to have to prove it—not just to the Canucks, but to the rest of the National Hockey. Not League. even, not even early in the year, Blake. Hey, he's got to play. He's got to produce. He's got to show. Hey, uh, one thing about Tanner Pearson, I'll say, guys, uh, when, when, when Quinn Hughes went to bat for him, that told me a lot. Uh, when Travis Green was here, uh, he had nothing but respect for Pearson in the dressing room. He's a, he's a mature pro. He's won. Does all the little things right. And I got to tell you, when when Quinn Hughes went to bat for him, that was significant for me. And you don't go to bat uh, for someone like that unless you you know he's a teammate that's loved in that dressing room. But uh, you you nailed it too, Blake. I mean, he's on the ex- final year of his deal. And but how do you get him in the lineup? How do you get him up to speed? There's a new coach. The last time Tanner Pearson left, there was an, another coach. Now he's got to fit in with Rick talking. So there's a whole lot of things to play when it comes to Tanner Pearson. What do you think? Like we heard so much last year from management uh, about how disappointed they were in training camp and ultimately the preseason and that sort of set the tone. And we both Elvin and Rutherford kind of threw darts at Bruce Boudreau for his training camp. Uh, Rick talking kind of laid down the law for all these players on their way out the door uh, how much whip cracking do you think there's going to be under a, a Rick Tockett training camp this time around? Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm a, I'm a big, uh, big fan of Tockett and what he's done in the short time he's got here. And he he did two things that stuck up. He brought in Gonchar and Foot to teach. Just because you're at the NHL level doesn't mean you can't learn. You know, he he the, he got these guys and he said teach them, and that was important for me. That was one. And two, he cracked the whip on conditioning. I'm going to tell you something right now. I I am predicting. There is no question in my mind. This is going to be one of the most well-conditioned Canucks teams at training camp in years. I don't want to be the guy that shows up to that camp out of shape in Victoria. I don't want to be that guy. And there's I don't think uh, the agents I've talked to this summer. Uh, they have all informed me. Their guys are working out. They're getting ready. There's a different feel and a vibe under talking. There's no question in my mind. There's no question. He's a teacher. You learn just, we as media, I learn a lot just listening to his practices and, and his post game. He's a fun guy to listen to talk hockey. And I, I think when he hammered that message, be in shape or else, I, okay, look, you know when Russell Wilson started tweeting those videos in the, in the off season, uh, him working out, I wasn't a big fan of that. You know, I was kind of like, hey, dude, everybody else is doing the same thing you are. But, you know, I'll tell you one thing. I love these. Uh, Kuzmenko videos that he puts out, and I'll tell you why. The difference between Wilson and Kuzmenko is 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 Kuzmenko is very likable. He, he to me was one of the best stories this past season. You know, he really was. This guy, and you, we can all learn from Kuzmenko, even in adversity, even when he was benched, even when he was leading the team in goals. He didn't bitch or whine or complain. He just went to the end of the bench, sat there, came back. He understood that Tockett was telling him. Defensively, you got to be better. You got to get in better shape. He's doing something about it. He's a very likable kid. He's got that energy, good vibes. Unlike Blake, he's not negative. He's a good, positive guy. And, you know, that's what you like to see. And I, I just think that here's, here's something for you. If, capital letters, if Kuzmenko was not in great shape and he still ended up with 39 goals and 74 points, what the hell is he going to be when he's in shape? You know, maybe Takic's telling him. This is just the. This isn't the bar for you. The bar is higher if you get in shape. Negative. You know what? I know Kessler mf'd me 
But I also know that Miller is not talking about me when he's talking about the guys oh. in Vancouver that he hey. hates. I, hey. That it. could be Hold Dolly Wall number one on the list, for all I know. Here's something for you guys. <laughs> so here's the quote. Where's the quote? You know, this is going to be fun because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something right now. <laughs> so... JT Miller said today, I can't stand some of the media. So anyway, I, I hey, hold it. I texted Miller's agent. I said, hey, here's the quote. Am I one of these guys? He says, no, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm, not one. I'm not one of them. I'm not one of them. I'm, I'm going to guarantee you Price is one of the guys. No that, chance. Uh, no about. chance. He doesn't know who I am. Uh, no, no get chance. The no fun zone. Hmm. You're the fucking negative guy, Price. <laughs> Miller is talking about you. Well, this was fun, though. I, I disagree <laughs> with you. This, this this was fun. This was the fun zone. Oh, yeah. Let me get uh, let me get this in. Yeah. Because uh, uh, I want I want to get this in before uh, before July first, and and you know as the Canucks go into the free agency and everything, you know I, I talked about Kuzmenko was one of the the big stories last year. I think another guy, uh, another situation that was positive for Vancouver was Abbotsford, and. Um, uh, the Canucks fielded a lot of calls from agents uh, before July 1st who wanted to get their players signed in Abbey. I've been hearing about this for a year. So that's a good sign because that wasn't happening when they are in Utica. Utica, I, I got horror stories of Utica, how badly it was run and how far away it was and everything. Jeremy Colton is a good young coach. He did a great job. The Sedin twins working with the prospects, that's massive. Uh, the farm team so close to Vancouver, I think uh, uh, I heard uh, Jeff talking about Seelovs and that situation worked out so good. Um, adding young players like Ratu, McDonough, Sassoni, Hiroshi, McWhort, the growth of Klimovich, uh, Baines, Nielsen, and Jet Wu were, were positives. Um, the Canucks still don't have one of the best farm systems flush with top prospects. But one of the reasons they don't is because they've traded so many first and second rounders. And then, you know, that, that hurts you because all you're left at the farm is third and fourth and fifth rounders, right? And then, of course, your prospect pool doesn't look as good. But I think they're slowly turning it around. I think that the things they're doing in Abbotsford, I'm, I get a lot of good feedback from the agents about Abbotsford. I think last year, one of the big things they did right was Abbotsford. I think the Sedin twins uh, was a massive move. I think Colleton is a good young coach. I think you're building some good young kids. Um, the Nielsen kid, you know, getting an NHL contract after working so hard, uh, that was a feel-good story for me. Um, you know, that kid worked uh, really, really, really hard. You know, he didn't go in the NHL draft. And, you know, he was a first-round pick of the Calgary Hitman. He's a BC boy, a Fort St. John native, but I, I know his dad. When I was up there, he used to pound beers with his dad. Uh, he said, what, are you, what are you laughing at? No, you of course you did. Of course you did. I know. Uh, hey, his, you were nine years old. Well, his you... uncle was one of the best players to ever play for the uh, the, the Golden Hawks, uh, the junior team up there back in the day. He's a good hockey family. And so I was really happy when he did that. He, you know, it, everyone talks about going to the draft, how important it is. It isn't. The NHL is flooded with players that didn't go in the draft. The Western Hockey League is flooded with players who didn't go in the draft. Look, look at uh, uh, Baines. You know, uh, he's another prime example. Didn't go in the Bantam draft. Didn't go in the NHL draft. He gets signed by the Vancouver Canucks. And he's and, and, and Baines last year, good steps. You know, he led Red Deer in scoring. He led the Western Hockey League in scoring. Jeff, you know how, yeah. how hard that is. But then he gets to Abbotsford. You know, your bottom six, work your way up. You know, play defensively well, kill penalties. And all of a sudden, his role changes. He's not the high-scoring kid. They had some good Jet Wu. You know, I didn't think that he was going to get a new contract in Vancouver, guys. He, he had a good year. So I just think uh, I was really impressed with uh, Abbotsford this year. I'm not saying it's the best farm team in the history of the world. I'm saying they are slowly turning that around. And getting to Abbotsford was a, was a massive first step. Sub-poll question, do you think Dollywall can last the rest of the summer without coming on Sakaris and Price? My vote is no. I bet you we talk uh, to you in a couple of weeks' time because you're bursting the at the seams with information, I bet. The Sakaris texted me all. He drives me nuts. 500 texts a day, that guy. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> Eventually, you'll give in again. Thank you for doing this today. Hey, I, I appreciate it. Listen, uh, uh, me and Taylor are going to Vikings, Seahawks, Thursday, free tickets. We wouldn't go otherwise. We're too fucking cheap. But listen, <laughs> we're going. It's going to be Dolly and uh, Donnie and Dolly trip. September 5th, Donnie and Dolly back. 
10 to 12, check TV, be there. This great clip brought to you by, wait for it, great clips. It's going to be great.